If you're a startup founder in today's time and especially on the tech side, this video just might be very useful for you because in this video, I'll be sharing how our startup CodeDam uses technology, uses all the tech stack to do various operations, which will cover a lot of SaaS tools as well as the tools we use for programming. So let's just go ahead and take a look at what products, what technologies, what is the tech stack of CodeDam. If you're new here, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon on. This is free of cost and helps the channel grow. All right, so before we start this video, I want to divide the tech stack basically in three, four things. The first one is front end. The second one is back end. The third one is something like a SaaS based tech stack. So the front end and back end technologies are pretty much, you know, you are aware about what they mean. The SaaS side of things would be something which probably is a mix of back end and front end, but is more suited towards general businesses as well, right? So let's start with front end. A few technologies which come to my mind is Next.js. Our whole tech stack is built on Next.js in a sense that all of the front end things or front end pages or anything you see on codedam.com or any other subdomain is built using Next.js. We use Tailwind for the styling part and we use TypeScript over here for type safety. On the back end, similarly, we use GraphQL in order to set up the correct resolvers, mutations and queries which automatically gives us a level of data validation as well. But to provide even more data validation, we use Joey as the data validation library so that people are not just passing anything on the back end. We use Redis primarily for caching the database queries and rate limiting endpoints, which is like super important. And to host this back end API, we use lambdas from AWS and behind the API gateway. Right, so this provides us the ability to scale this to a lot of calls, a lot of concurrent executions per second, right? So that's that's the advantage of using a serverless environment. This is basically serverless. Now building on top of this, we use MongoDB as the database and we host this MongoDB inside MongoDB Atlas and this whole structure over here, the GraphQL and the Lambda, the GraphQL, Lambda on which GraphQL is running and the MongoDB Atlas, is in a VPC. So this means that our MongoDB Atlas is not exposed to internet. So that is also like one important thing you should know about the security standpoint of view. Try to keep as many services in your local network as possible, right? So this VPC just needs a single NAT gateway, which is again an EC2 instance. This is not an architecture video, but yeah, I mean, again, we are using EC2 from AWS for as a NAT gateway. Then on the backend side for the video processing over here, which happens in video.js layer, the video processing is handled again by a mix of EC2 plus auto scaling group templates, which handle all the upscaling and downscaling plus FFmpeg, which is running on these instances. But in general, once the videos are prepared, they are uploaded to S3 buckets, which in turn sit behind the CloudFront CDN. Okay, this makes me remember that we use a little bit of Vasm, but not really for Monaco text editor as well, which is the editor which you see when you're practicing labs and building projects. And Vasm over there is used to load a library named Onigasm, which is a Vasm port of another library named Oniguruma, which is a library for use for TextMate based grammar parsing. So this means that on CodeDAM, you see much better syntax highlighting, much better colors when you are practicing and writing code inside Monaco, just like VS Code, because VS Code uses this library, but this is like a Vasm port of this so that it can run on the browsers. So this is where we use Vasm pretty much. For the SaaS sites, I think the most relevant tool we use, which is pretty much applicable for everyone, is SES from AWS, which is a simple email service provider, like it says, and you can use it to programmatically send tens of thousands of emails, even hundreds of thousands of emails. Email. It depends on how much limit AWS has set for you, but this is for email sending. So this is like a really important part of our business. Then we use a lot of GitHub and GitHub Actions. So basically GitHub Actions is just fine. This is used for our CI, CD and testing and even deployment. So, you know, you want your workflows to be available in a way where you don't have to do a lot of work with the infrastructure all the time. So that infrastructure as a code deployment using GitHub Actions is really, really helpful. We use G Suite primarily for email inboxes, but occasionally the services like Docs and Meet and stuff like that is also useful. But yeah, I mean, 
just paying for the branding, getting a Mayhole at the rate code dam under a Gmail like interface is what Google earns most of their money from. We use a lot of Slack bots and Slack integration so that we can receive updates from all these providers, whether that's GitHub, whether that's Vercel, whether that's Sentry, I'm gonna come to that, whether that's this and that. So integration with Slack bots over Slack is also useful because email at the end of the day is, you know, something which only a one endpoint can receive. So that is like limiting in a sense that if you want your whole team to receive an update, you need to broadcast that message in a chat based channel. So this is where our Slack and Slack bot integration comes in. For customer support, we use Crisp at the moment where we have also redirected an email address. So whenever you send an email to support at the rate code dam, that actually lands inside of the crisp inbox, which is shared across the team so that anyone can answer your query. We use Sentry for error handling on the website. So if the backend blows or something crashes, then those Sentry, Sentry code actually receives those errors. And then as you might have guessed, broadcast them into a Slack channel. For project management right now, till a certain extent, we use Notion, but we are exploring other tools at the moment as well so notion is great for data analytics and you know seeing what people are doing we use google analytics at the moment combined with amplitude for event-based analytics and finally for payments we use stripe and razor pay at the moment but we definitely would be shifting 100 percent to stripe the moment stripe introduces support for upi and upi auto pay so yeah i mean this is our tech stack in a nutshell today and of course i might have missed a couple of libraries not a couple of libraries basically a lot of libraries over there which are very specific in nature but the overall gist of everything is this i mean sure i have not written react or HTML or CSS over here, but that's that's like obvious stuff when I say Next.js and anything else, right? And of course, this whole tech stack also uses on the backend TypeScript. So we write strongly typed code, at least we try to do that with JavaScript and that requires us to use a lot of TypeScript. Yeah, I guess one thing which is missing here is the runners part. So we use at least right now we use digital ocean droplets for providing those interactive runners which you see and the reason for this is I do have a lot of digital ocean credits. Otherwise, I mean, AWS EC2s are just fine. So yep, that's pretty much it for the tech stack at a glance how a typical startup look like and works like this is all we use and this is like live in production right now so i'm not even kidding when you go to codedown.com and if you start exploring the website you could pretty much see all of this on the website one way or another so yeah that's pretty much it that's what comes to my mind when i think about codedam's tech stack if you know something which is we use at codedam and i have missed it out let me know in the comments section if you're running a startup or if you're doing a project which requires some additional tooling let me know in the comments as well interested to know more about these popular SaaS tools or backend technologies which you might be using of course this is not an exhaustive list so make sure you leave your suggestions your comments as well which technologies you might think I have missed out but should have written in this non-exhaustive list but yeah that's pretty much it for this video I hope you learned something new in this one if you did, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. That just helps the algorithm boost up the video. And I'm going to see you in the next video really soon. If you're still watching this video, make sure you comment down in the comment section. I watched this video till the end. Also, if you're not part of CodeDamp's Discord community, you are missing out a lot on events which we organize on a weekly basis to code. You already know the drill. Make sure you like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thank you so much for watching.